It's your open source advocate and I'm back with another video and today I'm answering your comments. I want to say thank you to all of my subscribers and all of my patrons over at Patreon. Seriously, you guys make this so worth it for me to do these videos every week. I really truly enjoy it and I just can't say thank you enough. If you're enjoying these videos, subscribe. Let YouTube know that I'm doing a good job by subscribing to the channel. Plus, you'll get notified when I have new videos coming out. And finally, if you're enjoying what I'm doing, give it a like. Just click on that thumbs up, and that way YouTube knows that you like it, and they'll pass it along to other people that might enjoy my content as well. I really appreciate it. Thank you again. Let's get started. All right, the first question comes from Steve Brayshaw. And this was about Barrier KVM. This is one that I covered a long time back. So if you've ever used anything to share your keyboard and your mouse between two different machines where you've got monitors sitting right next to each other side by side and you didn't want to have two different keyboards and mice on the table, you just really wanted to use the same one across both machines, that's what Barrier KVM does. Uh, maybe you've used one called Synergy in the past. There's several others that you can do mouse share, things like that. Apple kind of does it between the iPad and the desktop at this point. So Steve says, after this setup, what happens if your server machine is not running? Will the client machine default back to its own keyboard and mouse, assuming they're still connected? So yes, um, I still use Barrier KVM today. I share it between Linux and Windows and two Linux machines, multiple Linux machines, Windows and Mac, Linux and Mac. I've done it all um, and it works. It's just kind of getting it set up. Sometimes you have to run through some processes to see if different things are enabled or not, but that's a whole different video. But yeah, if uh, if your server machine for whatever reason disconnects, if your client machine disconnects, doesn't really matter. It'll just default back to whatever mouse and keyboard it has, whether that's a built-in mouse and keyboard on a laptop, if it's an external mouse and keyboard you've got connected somehow. Yes, it will absolutely just default right back to it. So Steve, don't sweat it. Uh, it's, it's out there. I'm sure this question is several years old now, but for anybody else who's wondering, if you go get Barrier KVM, uh, it should work fine and you should be able to use it and yeah, it, it'll just switch back on its own. All right, this next one comes from Corey Riley and they're asking, how do I get RDP, Remote Desktop Protocol, to work on Linux machines? Do they require something else to, uh, to be installed on them? And this is for Guacamole RDP, so if you've seen my video on Guacamole, if you're wondering, is there an RDP solution out there that I can use to get to uh, remote desktop sessions through my browser, then yes, there absolutely is. It's called Guacamole. It's a crazy name, but it's a really awesome setup. It gives you some really cool control. But yes, uh, Corey, if you if you need to run it on Linux, if you want to use RDP for Linux, then you need to install some kind of RDP server. Now, the most recent versions of Ubuntu 22.04 uh, the GNOME desktop with Wayland have actual RDP stuff already installed on it So you just need to go in and enable it set up a few things on it there to, to be able to connect to it And you can set it up in Wacamole. I've done it. It's great. It's really awesome I'll have a video on it here in a few weeks, maybe a month or so, but yeah, really cool uh, But if you don't have that version or if you don't already have the RDP stuff built into the operating system or the version of Linux You're using you can get free RDP and install that you can go get RDP servers that you, that you need that are out there That are free that are open source that you can use for sure Getting them set up and configured is a different story, so you kind of need to read through their documentation, but definitely you can do that. If you're just wanting to connect to it for real quick access, VNC might be the better way to go. Most Linux machines come with VNC server installed. You just need to enable it or turn it on maybe. Usually you can do that right through the UI. Once you've done that, just go set that up and walk up only instead because it can do RDP or VNC connections, which is really great. You can also do uh, remote sessions through the terminal through Guacamole if you didn't know that. So that's pretty awesome as well. So if you've just got a server that's headless and you just need to access the terminal, you can do that too. So Guacamole is a really cool application and I'll cover it again soon. Uh, I've got some updated videos coming up for it as well. So thanks for the question, Corey. All right, so I picked a couple of these out of my many, 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 many histories. Uh, but yeah, so people say I talk too much. Uh, so yeah, too much chatter, TLDR from VTrainer. There we go. And then uh, Raul also says, uh, you know, sorry, in my opinion, too much talk before entering into the matter. Yes, I talk a lot. Moving on. So we've got Merrick, and he is asking about PS Sense. He says, how is the security of the firewall out of the box once it's installed? Does it need more configuration? You know, and he says, closing comments, seems like there's really nothing else to be done on the firewall. And that's true. Yeah. So he was watching one of my PS Sense videos. 
and he noticed that I didn't really do a ton of configuration and, and on the install videos I don't. I really just kind of set it up. I show you how to make sure you've got the right NICs connected for it to be a firewall. So if you have multiple NICs, you want to have a WAN connection and a LAN connection at the very least. But once you've got that and you've got things connected correctly, you're pretty much set. The firewall by default has only outgoing connections allowed from the LAN to the WAN. So nothing incoming can get through until you open that up. It's really pretty much secure that way. Now there's a lot of things that you can do on the PFSense firewall. I've got some other videos that have shown you what you can do. You can set up VLANs, you can set up all kinds of really great stuff. And OpenSense is the same exact way, actually out of the box, as soon as you get those WAN and LAN connections set up, it's really ready to go. By default, the rules are set up to protect your network and let you have access to the internet. So that's awesome. So if that's what you're looking for, then it might be a really great solution. And you can install it on all kinds of hardware. You can install it as a virtual machine. You can install it as all kinds of different things. So really cool that you can do that stuff. But yes, absolutely. Um, definitely go check it out. All right, so from MR, <laughs> I get a lot of this, especially from my earlier videos. He was watching my Securing Nginx Proxy Manager video, which was a few years back at this point. And he says, excellent tutorial. Please get yourself a decent mic. So I've done that. Now, I do have vision problems, so sometimes I don't see so great, and I move closer to the screen for things that are very small, which sometimes takes me out of the path of the cardioid mic that I have, so it gets lower. But I, I had a really great listener and, and viewer who said, hey, your audio is not really great. Um, you should do some post-processing. And I told him, hey, I, I don't really know how to do that. So he was cool enough to get with me and actually walk me through using uh, audacity to get my audio separated from the video and do some post-processing so I try to do that on every single video now to make sure that it's as level as it can be and that it's at the right volume so that I'm not deafening you guys but at the same time I'm not getting so soft you can't hear what I'm saying but yes I do know that my older videos have some terrible audio I've done what I can with them but at some point I'll remake some of those things as well so you'll get better audio at that time but I do appreciate the feedback I really do I know that people think that um, giving harsh feedback is mean or something like that. I get a lot of people who defend me, which I truly appreciate that as well. But really, if somebody's giving me critical feedback that can help me do better, I love it. So I appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, I did get a better mic and I've got some post-processing skills going on that I'm working on and trying to develop as well. And for you guys that say I talk too much, there you go. I talked a lot on that one. <laughs> All right, Ricardo G. So it says, can you give me an idea of how well they stream video and audio? In this case, he's asking about these remote desktop tools where I did a comparison a few, a couple of months back between our port, remotely, Mesh Central, and Rust Desk. And really, I did that to give you the idea of what are these tools best suited for? What are they used for? How are they different? Which ones do I like and use? And, and I use all four of these, honestly. They're all great for different things, and I use them for different reasons. But uh, yeah, so he's asking, can you stream audio and video, or how well does it stream? Does YouTube work without stuttering? And the answer is no. These are not made for streaming video from a remote session to the, to the machine you're on. They stream the desktop. They use compression algorithms to do that. Um, they try to give you a fairly smooth... Uh, implementation so that you can see what you're doing but really they're support tools they're not meant for you to watch a video over over that streaming uh, you know channel that way so if you're looking for something that'll give you really good streaming over a remote connection like that you might want to check out steam and the steam link and then set that up between two machines there's tons of tutorials out there there's tons of YouTube videos out there on how to do that there's also something called sunlight and moonlight I think uh, are the two things but they work in tandem to give you some really fast streaming between two desktops. Uh, again, really meant for gaming, but would probably also work for video if that's what you're after. But there you go, a couple of ideas for you to check out. Nothing that I've done videos on, but something you can go kind of check out and find some other videos on. Hopefully that'll help you, Ricardo. All right, Brian Abston. First of all, Brian, awesome name. I love that name. Okay, next, uh, Trillium Notes. So he says, thanks for the review and you are welcome. And he has a question as well. You talked about running your backup script that zips up everything and copies it off. I would like more details on that and how you're doing it. So on most of my videos, I talk about setting up a hierarchy of folders. So my top level folder is a folder I just called Docker on whatever system I'm running those Docker containers on. Inside of that parent Docker folder, I put a folder for each application I'm going to run. So I'll have a folder for Trillium Notes. I'll have a folder for Nextcloud. I'll have a folder for Trago, I'll have a folder for all kinds of things. I've got tons and tons of containers and things that I run. So I create a folder for each application. And then when I set up that Docker Compose file, I make sure that I set 
any data volumes to be inside of that folder. So my Docker Compose file is inside of the Trillium Notes folder that's inside of the Docker folder. And then any data volumes that I'm mapping for that, I also put in that folder. I use dot slash and then the name of the volume and then colon, whatever I'm mapping it to in the container. And basically that keeps everything under that parent Docker folder. And then in the middle of the night, I've got a script that I run that basically compresses that Docker folder, gives it a name, gives it the date of and time that it was compressed. And then in that same script, I rsync it over to my NAS so that it's backed up for me. And then if anything really goes wrong horribly, I can just rebuild my virtual machine where that Docker system is running, install Docker, pull that back up over, unzip it, and everything is exactly like I had it. It's in the Docker folder, all the folders are there, all the data volumes are there. I just start running Docker Compose up commands on those things and getting them running and everything comes back the way that I had it. Now, if you're running things that have databases, which most things do, they have a MySQL or a Mongo or a Postgres or who knows what kind of database, you need to be a little careful. In the middle of the night, my servers are not doing anything. I, I don't have anything running that would be causing those, those MySQL databases or any other databases to be doing any kind of data at that time, anything with the data. So when it runs, those should be pretty much sitting there doing nothing, which makes it feel pretty safe. If you have a system that many people are using and it's at all times of the day, you really need to have a command that first brings down those containers runs that zip, moves it, and then brings them back up. So you have to kind of expand on that script that you're creating. It makes it a lot better and a lot safer to do it that way when you have data that could change. You could lose data if you try to compress that and change it while it's in the middle of trying to write data back and forth. So just be aware of that, a little warning, but that is how I do it, so I hope that helps you. If you want to know more, I'd be happy to do a video on it, and I might do a video on it here in the future just to show you guys what I'm doing. Uh, maybe share a script and make it open source so you guys could get it as well. All right, Biggie K. So he's talking about my R port video. He says, this looked great, but somewhat bummed out. I think there should be a remote protocol that does log the screen out like RDP does. Also, patch updates are just a notification. There's no action to it. I guess you can create a script, but how would that be triggered? So I understand your, your frustrations there, Biggie K. I really do. So first of all, there is another uh, thing that does RDP. It's called VNC, so you can use VNC for Linux, for Windows, for Mac OS, it doesn't matter. They all support the VNC protocol. It's not quite as fast as RDP, but it's, it's decent enough to use over a decent local network connection or internet connection and do exactly what you need to do. It's really no big deal. It's open source, it's free. You can get all kinds of uh, VNC servers to run on your machines and, and it will work. So you can use our port to connect to those VNC connections instead of RDP if you want to. The other cool thing about our port is that it's, it actually does exactly what you're asking for. Now, yes, the patch updates just send you a notification and you can create a PowerShell script. And there's even a video that I believe I linked to you in the description of this video so that you could get it. But it shows you how to set up that PowerShell script and what to write, what to put in the PowerShell script, how to save it in our port, and then how to apply it to multiple machines at once. So when your machines need an update, you can go check that script and then check all the machines you want to run it on and tell it to run. And our port itself will send out a message to all those machines that you're hosting and tell them, hey, run this script now and they will update themselves. And then it'll give you log output that you can see. It's really cool. It's, it's a very, very powerful system. So really, really recommend you check out our port. If you're using it for professional reasons, please go over and purchase an actual license from them. It makes them continue making our port great. It makes it so that you keep getting the best out of somebody who wants to make great software. And open source should always be that way. So please support them. But I hope that helps you. Uh, maybe you'll get something out of it there. All right. I cut off Alberto's last name, but it's Alberto Lopez. I apologize that. But he says, hello, Brian. Great video. Thank you. Two questions. And this is about Wacamole RDP, guys. So just in case you want the reference, it's down here at the bottom of the screen. He says, does TOTP, so that's a one-time pin, and HTTPS protect a remote Windows 10 machine that exposes the RDP port? The answer to that question is no. <laughs> so don't expect that. It does not protect the machines when you expose that RDP port. You should not expose that RDP port to the regular internet. Is there a way to secure such a PC using RDP permissions to deny access from unknown sites? I'll have to tell you, I don't know. I don't know if RDP has that capability in and of itself. But he says, I've read weird things 
related to RDP security. So here's my suggestion. If you're needing to RDP across the internet and access machines and you're concerned about the security that's there, which you should be, you should definitely use some kind of tunnel. And a VPN tunnel is the best thing you can do, whether that's a, a wire guard tunnel, an open VPN tunnel, it doesn't matter as long as you're protecting that thing and making sure that it's only accessible through that VPN then you are protecting that with so much security. It is so much better than just opening up a port trying to access RDP. You really shouldn't do that. Now, with a firewall appliance, you could also open up that port and then tell that appliance that only people coming from a specific IP can access that RDP, but that is not the best way to do it because people can spoof IPs they can make it look like they're coming from the place that they need to be and then they're in. So it's always better to use a VPN to access those types of things. 100% better always. All right, part B, he says, I watched your video on ticketing systems. And I wonder whether you know about open source software to keep track of repair history on electronics or PC repair. I don't know of anything specifically for just keeping the repair history. There are tons and tons of databases out there, tons and tons of open source software out there. I have not looked at them all, but I'm sure something exists. So I've added this to my to-do list. It's a really long list. A lot of people ask me for videos quite a bit, and it's, it's not that I don't want to do them. It's just that it takes me time to get out there and learn about this stuff, create a video, make sure that it's decent. As I've, as I've gone on from the beginning where I really did a horrible job, I'm trying to be not so terrible now and hopefully in the future a little bit better. So it takes me just more time to get ready to do those things, but I will, I've added this to my list already, as a matter of fact, so I'll be looking for that software for you, Alberto, and hopefully that'll help you. So this is one of snap drop from a long time ago, and this is from Jay, I'm going to call it Leyento, um, and he says, I thought snap drop only worked between devices on the same network, the same public IP, and he says, so how did you get it to work when your iPhone was on Wi-Fi or off the Wi-Fi network? So SnapDrop, if you're not aware, is an open source software. I'm not even sure if it's still developed, but if it is, it's really cool software. But if you've ever heard of AirDrop, where you could drop something from your iPhone to your Mac or from your Mac to your iPad or from your iPad to your phone or phone to phone from people in your network or close to you, it's a really, really awesome thing that Apple came up with. It's a secure way to share things with other people and it moves the file, the picture, whatever over. So I was like, okay, there has to be an open source version of this, right? So I found SnapDrop, I set it up and I was like, hey, this is cool. And it says it only works on your local network. Well, that's true if you're running it in a way that it only works in your local network, but I created a reverse proxy to snap drop and then when I connected two devices that were on different networks because it was on the proxy and the proxy was dealing with all of the URL stuff it allowed it to work um, so yeah basically setting up a reverse proxy made snap drop work on the public IP now whether snap drop was intended to work that way I can't say they may have figured out that there was a security hole there and closed it so I can't guarantee that if you go get it and do that today it's gonna work but at the time that's how I got that to work so um, if you want to try it, jump out there and go do it. It's probably worth a, worth a shot if you just want to have a little fun for one thing. But SnapDrop is really awesome. It's a, it's a pretty cool tool. All right, from Scott N., he says, You could redo this video and make it a lot more coherent. Uh, your recent videos are much higher bar than this one, so and it just doesn't reach that bar. So, yeah, so only Office. I did. I covered only Office a long time ago. I do need to give it a second run. So, Scott, I will do that. It's on my list now. I've added it because of your comment, and I will try to make it better. But, yes... That was, again, back when I was not doing so great, so I will try to make it a little bit better this next time and more coherent just for you, buddy. From a ton of people. <laughs> I get these questions a lot, so it's kind of a partial, but you'll understand. Did I? Did you inspect the code yourself for this project? The answer is almost always no, I didn't. I'm a, I can do some development, but I can't go in and inspect all of the code on every project, and even if I did, it doesn't mean that I would catch some kind of weird security thing anybody was doing. Um, you just have to get tools and try to check those things, but but yeah, I mean, no, the answer is almost always no, and, and it's not realistic to ask somebody to do that, uh, one person. So um, if you're worried about it, you you should probably you know go and, and check that stuff out yourself. Find out who has done audits. Ask them if they've had an audit done. Would they be able to be willing to get an audit done? Those kind of things. There's nothing wrong with asking those questions to the project if you're concerned about it. And the next one is, how do you know it's not sharing your data? I mean. There's lots of ways to do that, but I'd say the same question back to anybody who's using closed source software and thinks that for some reason that's a better option. 
Um, you, you can't even check on closed source software. It's going to do what it's going to do and too bad. So I, I 100% have more faith in open source software. Could somebody get in and put something malicious in? Absolutely. Could somebody get in and find it? Absolutely. Can people fix it? Absolutely. That's the whole beauty of open source. And that's why I love open source. That's why I'm an advocate for it. So yeah, there's, there's tools. So one thing that I run is an outgoing firewall called Open Snitch. I did a video on it a while back. If you're interested, go find it. It's out there. I promise it's great. It's really cool stuff. And basically it's an outgoing firewall. So anytime your machine tries to make a connection going out, it stops and it pops up a message that says, Hey, something's trying to make a connection out. And it tells you what the application is and it tells you what port and what's it, what it's trying to do. And you can get more details. It's really cool. And if you don't want to let it, you can say deny and it, it won't be able to reach out. If you do want to let it, you say allow and you can even set a permanent rule that says, yeah, I know this thing's always trying to do that. It's fine. I want it to do that. That's how it works. That's great. Um, it's, it's pretty cool. It's great software. It's gotten some updates recently. It's got a GUI. So you, you've got a lot of really cool options out there. That's just one thing to try to help you protect yourself. That's not the only thing that can help you. But yeah, to answer this question, no, I don't expect every single project that I've that I've worked with. And uh, yeah, I mean, how do I know it's not sharing my data? You know, the outgoing firewall is a good indicator, but I've never had a single project that I've installed that's open source try to reach out and do something that I was not already aware of. So I don't know if that helps you guys. I've installed far more projects than I've ever done videos on, but yeah, that, that's the best I can give you. So, you know, I, I hope it helps. I hope it gives you a little bit of comfort, but you know, it, it's good for you to be a little bit untrusting. That's, that's wise. Be untrusting and, and make people earn your trust. That's a good thing. So if you've got a question for me, please just send it in. Ask. I don't mind. I don't mind questions. I don't mind criticism. Honestly, if it's criticism that's trying to really make me better, you know, if you just try not to be too harsh, but let me know, like I can do better and I'll try my best. I've tried to improve over the last few years. I'll continue to try and improve as we move forward. I want to give you guys some great content. I want to make sure that you know what's going on with open source. But if you have a question for me, I'm a pretty much an open book. Um, I'll talk about just, just about anything as long as it's relevant and makes sense and, and, and has something to do with anything we're talking about at the time. I don't mind. So uh, definitely write in to comments and I'll do another one of these when I hit 100,000. I'm at about 80,500 subscribers, which blows my mind for a channel that only focuses on open source software. But I cannot say thank you enough to all of you for, for being just so great for coming and watching my videos all the time for the ones that are my patrons on patreon thank you so so much you just don't understand how much it means to me but really truly i appreciate it if you'd like to contact me here's two great ways one is on a discussion server that i run it's discuss.opensourceisawesome.com it's a rocket chat server i've got several ways for you to authenticate you don't have to create an account on that server if you already have one of the other kinds of accounts go for it uh, also on Mastodon. If you use Mastodon, I like Mastodon. I've had a, I'm having a blast with it. So I am at MickNTX at Fostodon.org. That is my Mastodon address. So feel free to get out there and find me that way as well. Follow me on Mastodon and, and just, yeah, um, look out. Watch, watch for me. Uh, finally, you know, thank you so much. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you enjoyed this video, tell your friends about it. So then come along the open source journey with us and I'll talk to you next time. It's your open source advocate and I'm back and I've set up a store with a little bit of merchandise. I love being your open source advocate, but I want you guys to be the open source advocates with me. So if you want to get out there and get some of this stuff, and if you do, let me know what you think of it. Thank you for subscribing.